Father God, we just, all right. Good morning, good morning everyone. Here at Mount Olive Baptist Church, another beautiful day. Uh, our pastor, senior pastor here, Pastor Richard Norman. I thank God for everyone present here and all of our viewers. We thank God for you. Let's open up in prayer as we prepare to talk about the church in Philadelphia and we're going to uh, talk about lukewarmness. Father God, we just thank you, Heavenly Father, for another opportunity, Father God, that you've given us, Father God, to continue to move forward, Father God. You said, Heavenly Father, that you want to take us from glory to glory, Father God, never to be complacent, O oh God. But Heavenly Father, you know that I can do nothing without you, O oh God, but I had acts completely, Heavenly Father, that you remove all flesh out of the way, O oh God, so the spirit of the living God, Heavenly Father, that lives within me can freely have access, Father God, to be the teacher that you are. So teach me, Father God, guide me, Father God, in the words that I speak, Heavenly Father. Let them only be words, Heavenly Father, that comes from you, that has been taught by you, O oh God. So, Heavenly Father, that after the lesson is over, Heavenly Father, it will not fall on deaf ears, but it will accomplish that which you purpose it to accomplish even before the creation of the world because you said you first loved us before the foundation of the world we thank you we love you and we give you the praise and glory that you and you alone so rightfully deserve in the name that's above every name and at the name of jesus let it be settled by his people saying amen uh today last week we we're still on the church of uh Philadelphia in the book of Revelations, the third chapter. And last week we talked about faithfulness and what is faith, what it what it is to be faithful and a true witness. And then uh, we ended ta uh, talking about lukewarmness. And today that's what I want to talk about is the lukewarmness, lukewarm church in Philadelphia and what it means to be lukewarm. But I want to start out by reading a scripture here in John, two or uh, three scriptures. One starting out with uh, John 1 and 3, it says, All things, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then John 5 and 25, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. John 10 and 10, I come that they may have life and that they may have it to more abundantly. I want to go back to John 5.25. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Not someone dead, talking about someone in the grave, someone that then died. If we read here and we see it says, now I say unto you the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. What is he talking about? Our way of dead way of thinking. I had a way of thinking that was so dead, that was so religious, that would cause me to just walk in, not covenant, but it would cause me to walk in traditional things and thinking that I'm going about life or in the church doing what's right, but never making a difference in anyone's life. And so he was speaking to the dead things that, with, that is within us, bringing those dead things, those dead thoughts back to life. Just like when Paul was saying, he said, is, uh, Paul was saying that all the things that in Philippians, the third chapter, he was saying how he had gained all the worldly things. I'm going to paraphrase. He had gained all the worldly things. He said, but he had got prestige out in the community. He had got all these worldly things. But he came and he was very religious because he was taught 
uh, he was taught well in the Torah. He knew the Torah from inside out. He knew those first five books. He knew the books of the law, and he was taught very well in those books of the law. But at the same time, he was taught well, but look at his behavior. He could sit, and he could sit down, and he could teach with the best of teachers, but look at his behavior. He was still, uh, he had still that same person that has so much prestige out there in the world, in the community, <coughs> was the same person that went and got orders that to say, I'm going to harm them people. And we do the same thing. Religion does the same thing. Religion does the same thing like, it'll see someone come in here because they don't think like that. We'll say, well, you know what? I can't even sit down and have lunch with them. I don't even want to fellowship with them because they don't think like me. You know, you don't think like me. You're not in the same church I am. You know, you don't believe the same doctrine I am. And then we allow those things right there, those traditional things to stop us whether we right or wrong, but to stop us from having fellowship with one another. And the Bible clearly tells us in Romans, uh, I mean, in, in 1 John 4, 7, and 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. But he that loveth not, lo knoweth not God, because God is love. And so what I say we can have all the gifts, we can have knowledge, we can have all those things, and then we take those things and we hang them things up. But if our love life is, is weak, because our love life is our curtain rod, and so if that curtain rod is weak and if it's not strong, after you get so much up under there, everything collapses. It just collapses. You know, and so uh, that's how the Apostle Paul, when he stepped from religion to relationship, then his life changed. Then he was no more going about uh, those Gentile people, oh, you can't be saved or you're not saved or anything. You know, he didn't see them the way he saw, saw them as a religious man. He wasn't attacking them. And sometimes we attack the things that even if it's wrong, for instance, want to go somewhere with, I was at the barber shop, sir. I was at the barber shop one day and I was getting my hair cut and this lady sat next to me. And she sat next to me and uh, so I was reading at the time and then I stopped and I said hi and then we started talking to one another. And we start talking to one another, and I told her oh, where I was going to church, and I don't know how God just shifted the conversation. And I shared something with her, and she stopped, and she said, you know I'm gay, just like that. And I said, I know it. I said, I know it. And I said, Ann? And she said, you know something? You said something. And I said, but she said, now I have a partner. And she said, she was speaking to me the other night, and she said, I would love to go to church. And she said, I told her, I would love to, too. But you know we can't, because we're not going to be accepted. And I said, you're wrong. I said, if you walk in here where we at, and you walk in this place, even though I don't agree with you, I have a responsibility to respect and love you. See, because love, the Bible says love covers a multitude of fault. But because the church sometimes is so lukewarm and we have traditions and we like, I ain't going to sit next to them. I ain't going to speak to You see them? Look at them over there, their behavior, and look at that, how bad they am. And God clearly tells us, he said, remember what you were before I saved you? Because when I look back on my life and I see the things that God had brought me from, Man, and it was his loving kindness that we say, and his tender mercy that was, and then it was a sacrifice that he made even before the creation of the world. And I said, look at this. I said, you know what? God loved us so much. 
He knew what was going to take place before it take place. He knew what, how Bobby's life was going to be a mess before Bobby was born because he said, I first love you before the foundation of the world. And then Revelations 13 and 8, it says, look at here, we talk about Eve and we talk about the mess in the garden. He knew the mess that was going to take place, but he made preparation for the mess before it take place before it took place because it said the lamb Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world God loved me so much he had made preparations for me to come out of my troubles before I got in them we love our kids that way some of us as real parents we see some of the things that our kids are troubled that they're going to go through that they fix some of the mistakes that they're going to make. So we already making preparations for the mistakes before they make them. See, because of our love. And love does that right there. Love doesn't mean that we have to agree with the person. I don't agree with it. But if I just beat you down, I'm going to just push you further. I need to get you in a place. And let's sit down. And me and that lady, we sit down and we talked and everything. And we sit there and, and we had a wonderful conversation. And I did not get on because God didn't want me to get on. Oh, you know what you're doing. You're going to go to hell and all of that right there. When I was out there, I'm going to tell you something. When I was out there, Brother Brown, when I was out there messing up and doing things I had no business doing, I did not need you or the church to come tell me, Bobby, you know you shouldn't be drinking that alcohol and you shouldn't be doing them drugs. I know what I'm doing. Now tell me how to stop doing what I'm doing teach me something you know and that's the problem the people here God was saying hey if you don't deal with this lukewarmness this with this being so dumbed down with religion because that's what religion does it keeps us so dumbed down and it keeps us divided and if I look at religion and I don't know history sir like you know history but I know somewhat I, when I've had the little bit that I do know history have always done this it has always divided. I mean, religion, tradition, religion has always divided. I look at the churches and how God's church started out. And then I said, I look at all, the, and we go over here and we say, hey, well, where you go? Oh, I'm Baptist. Oh, oh, I'm Pentecostal. I'm Presbyterian. I'm Catholic. And I'm all these things. And we have all these labels up on our chest, you know. And I don't hear it. Well, I have a relationship with the Lord. You know, and I'm becoming something. I'm becoming a Christian. That's who I am. I am becoming a Christian. I'm not because I ain't Christ-like. I got some mess in my life, but I am becoming because the Bible says he gave some to be pastors, teachers, evangelists. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry till we come into the perfect man. When do you transition into the perfect man? When you leave this earth. And so until then, you are not that perfect man. Because God said in the Bible, he hovered over the earth and he could not find one. No, not one perfect. No one to die for the sins of the world. He was the only perfect sacrifice slain before the foundation of the world that was able to walk this earth and die for the sins of mankind. The only one. So we becoming something. I'm not there. I'm becoming that person that Christ had cre already created me to be. I'm becoming that. And then when I transition, I will be. Yes, sir. And I will see him for who he is. But when we say this is who I am, and then I'm like, it's like oh, I arrived. No, I ain't. I ain't arrived. Because I'll tell anyone, I am a minister and God allow me to be in this place, not because of that I'm so great or anything. And, I, and I'm not ashamed to say, follow me for a week. And you'll see some things you don't like. I promise you that. But get to know me. Get to know me. And you'll understand, even with my mistakes, you'll understand my direction. I'm pressing. Paul said, it ain't that I am perfect or may have been made perfected yet. But this one thing that I do do, I'm forgetting what's being, I'm forgetting my old behavior because I'm working on something new. I am working on something new. 
See, I'm a work in progress, but I have a heart to do that which is pleasing before God. See, but I just stumbled along the way. Donnie McClurkin said it in the song. And we sang the song, and I'm like, do you understand what it's saying? Some of these songs, we, we fall down, but we get up. A saint is just a sinner who fell down, but he got up because God, when the curtain was torn, he gave us a place to go. So we, we can get this right, we can get up, and we can continue to push on. That's why Romans 8 chapter it says, Therefore now there is no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. I'm not following this flesh, but I, the flesh sometime trip me up. You know, I stumble. There's some stumbling blocks along this path. And if all you see is the only time when I say, you can't help me, I say, if you see, oh, Bobby, you know you did, you know Bobby did this, I heard him say a curse word. And if all you see, I say, you can't help me. There is nothing you can do for me because you don't even have faith. Because what, what is faith? Faith sees not with natural eyes, faith sees with spiritual eyes. See, when God went to the blind man, he knew he was blind. He knew exactly that man was blind. But in order to help, he had to see past his blindness. And if you can't see past my faults, then you can't help me. There's nothing you can do for me. You know, and we say that, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. And we go into church and we, oh, you know what? You just need to do this and you need to do, but ain't relationship ain't nowhere in there. You're telling me what I, and I already know I need to, because I don't like, oh, like Paul said, oh, rich man that I am. Who? Is there any who's out there that can help me, that's willing to help me and stop telling me? what I need to do and I know what I need to do. I'm in bondage right now. I'm in slavery right now. I don't want to be in slavery. Send me someone that can help me get out of this bondage, my way of my dead way of thinking. I don't want to think like that. I'm trapped. But all you coming to do is tell me that, oh, you need to do this. That ain't going to help me. It just won't. It says here, it says, there is the complaint. The complaint is shocking for it unquestionably describes most, most church members. What is the complaint? Lukewarmness. Note exactly what Christ says. The church and its members were neither cold nor hot. This means, Pastor Norman, they were only lukewarm, half committed, only half-hearted, they were complacent, lethargic, self-satisfied, they were indifferent and neutral. I got a car that can run real fast, uh, Sister Ira. I mean, I got that truck, it'll move. But if I stick it in neutral and I hit the gas, see, 2 Peter 1 and 3 says, God's divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, but it comes through the knowledge of him that's given us virtue. He's given us dunamis power, dynamite. But because we're in neutral, help us, Pastor Norman. The church was lukewarm when it says they were lukewarm and half, what is half committed? <laughs> not fully committed you're not you're not using your full ability to do what god has called you to do if you have committed then you know you know it's just like okay i want more i want more out of you god is looking at us and said i i need more of you you're not really committed because if you're really committed you you be you be on fire you be doing a whole lot more than what you're doing now but if you only have committed something you only given partial of what god expects out of you we, it's just like we go on our jobs. You have committed. Your supervisor's gonna call you in a minute and say you ain't doing what we hired you to do. Yes, sir. You you're not earning the check that you're getting every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, but yet we're doing the church. We'll sit here and be half committed because we don't think God is paying us anyway. So that, but you forget the payday comes at the end when the job is complete. 
not before. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, we have committed because oh, I don't see nothing going to happen out of this. I ain't going to do this in the church. I'm not going to do that because uh, yeah, I, I just take too much of my time. But on your job, when you've been on your job and they tell you you have committed and if you don't straighten up, you ain't going to be committed at all. So what do you do? You change, don't you? You change, that's right. So we, we have to develop an attitude that when we have committed, you got to understand something. If you have committed, you think God should bless you when you just have committed to what he wants you to do? Mm -hmm. Just like the world say, you know what? You ain't doing what we want you to do, so you ain't going to get much out of us. Mm -hmm. Tit for tat. I want you to work and I'll go pay you. Mm -hmm. God is not going to pay us pit to tat, but God gives you more than you ever needed. But you got to be committed to what he wants you to do. That's right. That's right. Amen. God, God gives you the tools and the talent. He, can, he gave you that. But you just, you just what, half using it. Yes. God, he, he, he says a word. If you're not going to use it, I'll take it away and give it to somebody else. Mm, 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 mm. Where are you going to be then? Mm -hmm. So we have to be fully committed to mm. what we do. I, you know, I don't want no half committed choir members. I don't want no half committed deacons. What does half committed mean? I need two deacons to make a whole deacon because they half committed? Mm -hmm. So, so, so uh, I, we, we, we need, we need uh, even just a member of the church need to be fully committed. That's right. You know what, what uh, the half committed thinks? They'll get up in the morning and say, well, I'll just, not today, next week I'll come. Fully committed that every Sunday they getting up no matter what and, and make it out to the church. Mm -hmm. So we all, uh, every aspect in the church, we need to be fully committed. And Amen. the church in Philadelphia, that was their problem, not being fully committed. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you don't know what to do with somebody who's not fully, you, you, do you need to mo motivate them? Do you need to help them? You don't know what to do, folks. Don't know just, what to do. Uh, you don't know what to do with no. them. Amen. Amen. And you know something, that's why... When we as, uh, we as believers, Christians, I said, uh, I, I mentioned to someone before, I said, you know what? And I said, you have to hear me. You, you're probably going to get mad. And I said, but you have to hear me. I said, you saved, but you're not delivered. See, the Israelites were God's chosen people. But uh, they were in a place because of themselves for 430 years. And they were in bondage. Uh, and then when God, they cried, they cried. And then when God sent them help uh, by way of a man, and sometime God, you know, that's because he said a body that I need. And, uh, and so he sent uh, the prophet there, uh, Moses, right? And he sent them there. He sent him here, Joshua, Caleb. And, you know, they helped. And he did what he needed to do. He listened to the Lord. And so... Uh, after the 430 years, they came out of slavery, and they, they came out, and God dealt with uh, their oppositions. He dealt with Pharaoh, the army mother. He dealt with all of them and opened the Red Sea. They crossed over, but even before they got out of slavery, God said something that was so profound. He said, I already have a land for you flowing with milk and honey. See, the land is already prepared. It's just waiting for you to enter the land. And so, and I was thinking, I said, now, them are God's people. He had the land available to them. But when they came out and he dealt with, they, God dealt with their opposition, Pharaoh and his army, his men, then things were good. When things are good in my life, and you say, you come up to me, Sister Ira, and you say, Brother Bobby, how you doing? Oh, God is good. I mean, you know, my bills are paid. Uh, man, I just got a new car today. I got a raise on my job, and, and, and everybody in my household is healthy and all of that. But then what they didn't understand, there was still a journey to get there to the other side over there, to the place that God wants them. And God did not bring us out of darkness into his wonderful light for us to continue to be about our business see we have to be about our father's business in order for him to take care of our business in order for us to go into the place that he wants us to enter in see but if we don't enter in them places and they didn't enter into the place because in uh numbers i believe the 14th chapter if you read 
you, you read there, if you go to Numbers, the 14th chapter, them folks start complaining. Them folks even picked up rocks to stone the prophets. They were going to kill the man. And when they told them, especially when they said, hey, if we just be, was it obedient? They said, uh, Caleb and, and, and Joshua said, we can enter the land. God said, if we do this, we can enter the land. We can take these giants. Don't look at them as giants. They like grasshoppers. They're nothing. And so, but they didn't do it because they start complaining. They were complaining. They picked up rocks. They wanted to stone the man. And then God said, you know what? In other words, I'm done with them. They ain't going to make it. That generation right there, he said, I'm a, he was going to wipe them all out. But Moses prayed. And I believe Moses interceded, interceded because Moses said, Lord, think about what you're going to do. Just think about what you're going to do. He said, because if you kill them, the other people are going to say they didn't enter in because you couldn't bring them in. And so, and God said, okay, but from 20 years and up, these people are not going to enter in. And so I said it to say this, we can't be mad when we look at the world and the world is prospering the way they prospering. The world is having things that God said, you know what, I would like for you to have, but you're disobedient, I can't give it to you. You know, you guys fighting among yourself, you so traditional, you're religious, you know, you don't want to move from, uh, uh, you, you don't want to move from uh, uh, religion to covenant, you want to stick with religion because you walk in here, that's my seat, you know, Oh, that's the way I used to do things. Oh, that's the way I've been doing it all my life. All this kind of stuff right here that we hear, and then we look at the world, and we see them prospering, and we got the audacity to get mad. And if you look at Genesis, the 11th chapter, those folks wouldn't save, I believe now. I stand to be corrected, but when they were building that tower of back to back, uh, uh, the tower to heaven, they were saying, they, what did, the, what did God say? God said, I have to stop them. And if I don't stop them, nothing would be impossible for them because they're working as a team. So God had to come down and, and change their language where they couldn't communicate with one another. But they were able to complete the things because they worked together. And in the book of Acts, the second chapter, we see in the second chapter of Acts, when the people, when Peter ministered to the people, the people heard it, they were convicted, then they got saved, and then you continue to read, they said, and then the people came together with one common denominator, all different gifts from different backgrounds, but they came together in unity, and they said, and then God added to the church daily, and no one there went without. Because God is a God of perfect order. There is no disorder in God. God is a God of perfect And then how can we think if God is a God of perfect order, we can receive something from him being out of order. And we don't want to say it with our little ways and behaviors and all of that. And he's telling us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things shall be added on. That's why, and I said it before, Jesus wasn't tripping. Lazarus, he let him stay there for four days because the law says four days, in the, man dead for four days, no more life in the body. But Jesus wasn't tripping off that. He had already told him, he just resting. He said his death, this isn't on to this, his death. This is on to the glory of God. And then when he stood there, he didn't stand there when he was praying and he didn't say, Father, I sure hope this prayer going to work. You know, I, I just hope you do this. Or oh, Lord, please do this for me. He knew because he was in perfect union with his father. Perfect. He could stand there with all confidence and he said, Father, I know you hear me. You always hear me, but for the people's sake, Lazarus, get up. He said, for the people's sake, Lazarus, get up. And then when Lazarus got up, hear me by the Spirit, when Lazarus got up, just like when he brought me from death to life, and then now I'm saved, he said, take his grave clothes off, loose him. 
Ephesians 4.17 says what? This I say therefore in testifying the Lord that we henceforth not live as the rest of the world live in the vanity of their minds having their understanding darkened and because of that it alienates you from the life that is in Christ Jesus because of the ignorance that is in you. But if you have learned from him and been taught by him as the truth is in him, he said, then take it off. Take off those behaviors. See, take them off. Take off that tradition and all that stuff right there that's keeping you in bondage. I ain't going to forgive that person. You don't know what they did to me. Well, don't forgive them. Stay in bondage because it's keeping you in bondage. That same person that you say you're not going to forgive, and we've witnessed that people, we say, I ain't going to talk to no more. they going about their life. they just having fun and enjoying life, and we over here miserable and all, you know, and we hating that they having fun, and we could have the same freedom, but we're in bondage because God says forgive. If you, uh, he said, whatsoever things, Mark 11th chapter, he said, whatsoever things you ask for, if you believe you can have them, but if you have ought against anyone, forgive, so that your heavenly Father in heaven can also forgive your sins. I have sins too, all sin and fall short. See, I got issues. I have some issues, but I know where I'm striving to get to. In your class, teacher, now I'm going to pull on you right here because, hey, you here, so I'm going to use you right now. Pastor Norman, is it okay? I'm going to use him. Uh, here where it says, they were complacent, lethargic, and self-satisfied. What does that mean? Self-satisfied. About yourself, huh? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. It's limited. it's limited, huh? So you mean self-satisfied can limit me? Yes. Yes. Whoa, isn't that something? And we think self-satisfied can help us. It's the betterment for ourselves. But you see how we are being tricked? That's why when Jesus said something, he said it, uh, Pastor Norman, in... Uh, Matthew, the fourth chapter. Remember when he had came out of 40 days, 40 nights of fasting? What did the tempter say to him? Well, he said several things, but at the time, this time he, he chose to tempt him when he's at his weakness, at his weakest point. But he also used the word. You know, that shows us that there are people out there that know the word that will use the word against you, not for what it's pretending to be. He said, he said, he showed him all these, he said, you hungry. You turn these bread into, into, turn these stones into bread, which he could do. He said, you can't live by bread alone. He took him to the mountain, up to the top, top of the temple, throw yourself down. And he said, you know what? He said, 10,000 angels will come and protect you. He said, not to tempt the Lord your God. Every time he wanted to get him, he'd use the word against me. But thank God, the word was there in the flesh. And so the word in the flesh say he was really telling the devil, you know what? You can use this all you want to, but you forget. I'm the one who wrote this, and I know what it's all about. Mm -hmm. you, you, you bring it to, she said, you're doing secondhand. I'm firsthand. Before you were, I was. Mm -hmm. And before I, you know, and before that, I, the word is me. That's right. I, I'm the flesh. Mm -hmm. I'm the author of this. Mm -hmm. And you can quote all you want to, but see, I'm not only the author, I wrote it, but I know what the intent of it was when I wrote it. Amen. My intent was to make sure that you didn't use this against folk. Right. And that's why I have the word to, today. Yes. And so so we, have to, we have to live by the word that God gives us. Yes, yes. And there's people out there that's, to this day, we ran to one yesterday walking in the neighborhood that's, that's taking the word and using it in a way that's not, not what God intended for it to be. Right, right. This, this lady was trying to tell us that you can only be saved. The only way you can save is unless you speak in tongues. Right, There ain't right. no way in the Bible it says that. No, no. So I had to have, my wife had the discussion. Where we had the discussion? She's trying to, she said, my wife said, what do you mean? If I don't talk in tongues, I'm not saved? I ain't never talked in tongues, but you better not tell me I'm not saved. <laughs> I didn't put my work in. I didn't, I, I didn't, uh-uh. 
Right, right. We, so, so we, there's people out to misinterpret. So we have to be careful of that. Yes, yes. And see, and that's so true. And then the other thing here, and I'm in closing, uh, when Jesus was being t tempted, Jesus, yes, he's God manifested in the flesh, but when he came to the earth, he came here as a man. Even though he was God, he was man too. So in order for him, he had to feel everything that we felt. You know, he humbled himself down to a servant. And then so he had to feel the things. So he felt hunger at the time. He felt all those things and he had a need. See, because at the time he was a human, he was a man like me and you. When the tempter came to him, but what he had inside of him and so what he did here, look at here, and I'm going to finish with this. Jesus never, because he, he told us, he said, I come here not to do my will, but the will of the one that sent me. And then so he did this. He said, look at here. We're going to, uh, he took him to the tour. See, the devil can't contend against the word. So Jesus said, it is written, all the commandments which I command you this day, Thee, I command thee, this day shall you observe to do. Why? That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. See? And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you to know what was in thy heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So, verse 3, so he humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. And see, Jesus never lived. Jesus, he was a man at the time. He felt everything. Yes, he was God. But when he came to the earth, he had to feel everything that we felt. And so, and at that time, this was Jesus Christ, the man. And he felt. And he had a need. But he still had the word of God inside of him. And he knew what he came to the earth to do. To complete the work that his father sent him to complete. So when he was in a place where he had such a need and he was hungry. He said it is written. Let me in other words. You know the scripture devil. Let me take you to the scriptures. And read this to you. The scripture says. Man should not live by bread alone. So he didn't lean on his own understanding. He leaned on his father and his word. And when his word go forth, he couldn't contend against the word. Because the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong and mighty tower. And we are the righteousness of God. And the righteous run to that name and it would keep them safe. But when I run to my tradition. In my lukewarmness, then we don't, we shouldn't even have to trip or wonder why, oh, I'm not safe or this or that isn't happening. Or why we're suffering in the body, in the church that God called us to and he doesn't want us to. He wants us to shine because he said, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men on myself. And then he said, there's no greater love than one that laid down his life for his brother. So we have to, we have to look at that and say, what is he talking about? And that's why I tell people, and with all due respect, I said, heaven is not my goal. Going to heaven, we preach that, oh, I want to go to heaven. I'm ready to go to heaven. I'm heaven ready. I ain't heaven ready. When I get sick, I call the doctor. When I get sick, I call my pastor and say, pray for me. I ain't ready. My mission, my goal is to complete that which God has called me to here on earth and to enjoy the fruits of my labor while I'm here. And then when my time come, like Paul said, then I can shout and say, 
My time for departure has arrived because I kept the faith, I did the work, and now I know what's stored up for me is crowns of righteousness. Father God, I just thank you, Heavenly Father, for this lesson. Oh God, I thank you, Heavenly Father, that it wasn't me, oh God. I know it's the Spirit of the living God that's teaching this lesson, oh God. But I thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the hearers. Blessed and highly favored is everyone here up under the sound of my voice. You told me, Father God, speak words of life and never death, Father God. So I speak blessings over everyone in, in, under the sound of my voice. God, thanking you for them, Father God, and then asking you, Heavenly Father, that more than anything, Heavenly Father, give us a desire, Father God, to just know you in the power that's in your resurrection, resurrecting us from our dead way of thinking, oh God. We thank you, we love you, and we give you the glory that you and you alone so rightfully deserve in the name that's above every name, and at the name of Jesus, let it be settled by saying amen. Amen. Amen.